Today, we are going to write a chat group application in the C language. And there will be one server and many clients connected to it. For this application, we are going to learn the socket programming in the C language and with a lot of explanation and details. And of course, that might be unnecessary for some of you, the amount of the explanation that we'll have. But since I think that like me, myself, the C language might not be your strong suit as well. So I will try to explain every function that we are going to use. We will do some threading stuff as well and make it possible to multiple clients to connect simultaneously. And like I said, I'm going to explain everything about the threading, about the socket, and I'm not expecting any prerequisite for this session. The socket API in the C language is the closest that we could get to the implementation inside the kernel of our operating system. So as you know, and as we have explained it in the previous session, the Berkeley socket is implemented in the C language inside the kernel of our operating system. And the API that we are going to use today will actually call those implementation inside your kernel and even the function names are the same and it's like a facade for that API. So let's get it started. So I'm using the CLion IDE here, but you could use any IDE of your choice and it doesn't matter actually. So I've created a simple project here, a new project, and I've named it Socket Client. And we are going to write the client side of this application that we are going to uh, use in, in the chat group application. So let's get rid of this and let's start it. So the first thing that we should do, as we saw in the Berkeley sockets, uh, first we should create a socket. So now we are writing the client side of this application. So for this, because we are writing the client, there must be some server sitting idle and listening for the incoming connection. And because we don't have the server side yet, we will try to first connect to some other server and then we will write the server side and then we will connect the, this application, the client side application to our own server. So for writing a client socket, first we need to uh, call the socket function. So there is the socket function that is inside the socket.h file and, and it just included here for me. And it accepts and requires three parameters. So the first one is the domain, which actually is the address family that we are going to use. So we could use the IP version four or IP version six as the addressing here. But because we are using the IP version four, I'm going to actually set it as address family inet, which means IP version four. The second parameter, which is the type, specifies the type of the socket. Since we could create a TCP socket or a UDP socket, we could pass either of those values. And here, because we are going to use the TCP socket at first, I'm going to pass as socket stream. The socket stream actually means that we are uh, asking for a TCP socket here. And the third one, we are going to pass zero. The third one, which is the protocol, determines the uh, layer beneath the transport layer that we are using. So if you don't know about the layers in networking, the TCP and the UDP are in the transportation layer, and there are other layers beneath it that the, the socket layer will call after after being done with packaging and ac actually specifying the ports and all that stuff. And it will pass it to the layer underneath it. And the layer underneath it will actually do it, its stuff and uh, put it in the IP packet and it will pass it to the other layer. So as you can see, the network is a layered architecture that a, a sequence of data will be passed layer by, by layer and all the layers will 
add and will put the uh, receive data on, into their own envelope. Now, with specifying it number zero here, we are saying that we want the IP layer as the layer to be used uh, in, underneath our transportation layer. And it's most of the time it's number zero. But because the socket API could be used as, as a facade and as API on top of other network layers, they have actually implemented the API in this way. So after create, creating the socket, it will return an integer number. And the integer number, if it is, it is not a negative number, it is not minus one, then it means that it, the socket has been created successfully and a socket file descriptor will be returned. So uh, the sockets have been implemented in a way that it's, it's a file in your system actually, because uh, when you uh, talk and when you, when you create a file in your system or when you read and write to a file, you grab a, f a file descriptor and you uh, write and read off of that. And when we create a socket, and we connect to the other side, it's, it's like that from the point of the view, from the operating system's point of the view, it's like that it has created a file descriptor for us and we could use it the same way that we are using the files in C language. So it will return a socket file descriptor. And after that, we could use this file descriptor to connect to some remote socket somewhere sitting idle. So the function connect is asking for a file descriptor, and then it is asking for an address and the length of that address. So let's first pass the socket file descriptor. Now we have to specify the address of the server that we want the socket to connect, connect to. And for that, we could use the socket address a structure, but the socket address structure is the parent structure, we could say, because this socket API is both used for IP version four and IP version six. There are two other, now let me specify the address, address. So we have to import it. So it will import this socket address underline in from the in.h. And this structure is actually used for IP version four, but the APIs, the functions, as you'll see along the way, all of them are accepting the general socket address, which is soc at, uh, and not the soc address in or soc in soc address in six. But when we want to use the IP version four or IP version six, we should cast the pointers to the appropriate type of address that we know. So because we are now using the IP version four, we are going to create the IP version four address. Okay, now we could pass this address and it is asking to pass the pointer to this address. And then we have to pass the size of this address. Perfect. Now. Before passing the address, of course, we should set the properties of the address. And that is first, of course, the port number, uh, which we talked about it in the previous episodes, that the port number will be the number that the, this process, this application process will acquire from the operating system so that the other side could connect to it. And the port number could be uh, a number between zero and 65,500, I think like that, two byte unsigned integer. And we could use any port number, but the port, I, I, until the port 1000, most of it is, is a reserved port and we are going to use ports uh, beyond 1000. So let's put, for example, specify the port 2000. And of course this, this port uh, should be the port of the server that is listening on the other side. So there must be a process which is listening on this same port, on port 2000, on the 
address that we are going to specify. And the address family, we are going to specify it as, again, address family IP version 4 or INET. And then last but not least, the IP address itself. And for this, the IP address, this S add is, is an unsigned integer, a third, a, a four byte integer. And as you know, the IP address is uh, actually has four parts, has four numbers inside it. So it, it requires four bytes. So here it's an integer. And if we want to, let's say that we have this IP address in a string form, for example, this number. So this is an IP address and you can see it has four numbers and it has been actually delimited by this dot between the numbers. So here we have to extract these numbers and make them an onsite byte and put it inside an onsite integer and then assign it to this, uh, to this property. But because it, it's a lot to do, there is a function named inet presentation to network and let me import it from the inet.h now it will exactly so we are telling that the ip version 4 and we are giving the ip and then we are telling it that it is the presentation form and please convert it to an unsigned integer and put it in the address that we are giving the pointer to. So the address, the pointer to address dot add dot s add. Now we can get rid of this. And here, the, these five lines of code is only constructing the address to, this, to some server. And at last, we will call this connect and it, the, the connect will, of course, return the result. And we could check this result to see if the connection has been made or not. And if, if it is zero, it means that if result equals zero, then print F that connection was successful. Backslash N. And now we should uh, connect to some server. And for, for the, because we don't have any server yet, we, we have not written any server, for the sake of an example, we are going to connect to the Google server, the search engine. So the google.com, as you know, is the domain name, and we could use any online tool, a DNS resolve tool, and we could pass the domain and ask for the IP address. This is the IP version 4 address of the Google server machines. So in this IP address in the network, there must be a machine sitting idle and listening on some port for the incoming connection. And when we actually uh, write google.com here, the, the browser, the Chrome browser is acting like a client here and it's connecting to the server, to this server, and it is asking for information, which is an HTML data, and it actually draws the presentation on your screen. So uh, because we cannot memorize the IP addresses, the domain names are used, but we could resolve the domain names to IP addresses. And if we, for example, say, uh, give the, this machine address, which is the address of the Google, and a colon and 80, because the port 80 is reserved for HTTP communication. And even in your browser, when you don't give the port 80, it will append it by default. Because as you know, for any socket communication, the port number should be specified. Because by specifying the address of the machine, you are only specifying the actually the machine itself. But you should also specify the process inside that machine that is listening for for this connection and that because most of the time the http connection is and http servers are using port number 80 if you don't specify it explicitly your browser will put the number 80 and 
if we hit enter, you'll see that the result uh, must be the same, actually. It is, the result is the same, but because the port 80 is for HTTP, not HTTPS, it is actually complaining here. I think the port 443 is for the HTTPS. Yep, yep, you can see that it's, it's correct. Now here, if we hit enter, you'll see that the result is exactly the same, you know? no matter that we are using the IP address or the domain name. So now that we have the IP address of Google, let's give the machine address as the IP, as the Google address, and the port, let's give it as port number 80. Now, a little thing that I've missed here is that uh, we cannot directly assign the port to the, to the SYN port, and we have to use the H host to network short. And what this function does is that it grabs the port number that you are passing it and it uh, actually gets the bytes inside it because the, the port number is, is a short, is an unsigned short integer, which means it's a two byte number. And as you know, when we write the bytes on the paper, we first write the most significant byte and then the, li the least significant byte. And this representation, this presentation is named the big Indian uh, presentation. But because inside the computers, some machines might store the bytes in the reverse order and might store the most, the least significant byte in, in the first actually memory address, it might be little Indian. Uh, and if you know, if you don't know about the Indians, uh, you could go to the Wikipedia site. It, it has everything there. So here we are actually saying that because the network Indian, the, because the network protocol, the TCP and UDP protocol, expect the big Indian form of the bytes being presented, uh, we are asking this function to put it in the right order, the bytes. So I think we are done. And if we connect, it should connect successfully. So let's run it and see if it connects to the Google client. And yeah, the connection was successful. Now, next thing that we are going to do is to send some stuff to the Google server now that the connection has been made and receive some uh, data. Now for sending and receiving data, it is exactly the same as working with a file or a standard input and output, like writing to the console. You know, after the connection has been made, uh, because we have the file descriptor, we have some file descriptor. Now it doesn't matter that this file descriptor belongs to a socket, a remote socket connection, or to some file in our system or the console uh, itself, it doesn't matter. We could use the same functions here. Now, if I'm going to use the send function and give the file descriptor, which is our socket file descriptor, and then we can pass, let me create a buffer here. Buffer 1024. And then we, we are going to pass the buffer and tell the number of bytes inside this buffer that we want to be sent to the other side. And then let's give it as this string length and import it from the string dot h in buffer k. And we passed zero as the flag because we are not going to uh, set any flags here. Okay, now it will send this to the other side and let me assign something, some message here. For example, let's give it as like this, that buffer, yep. Now we are going to send some data to the Google servers. Now, because we are connecting to the socket that only understands the HTTP protocol. Now we will talk about the HTTP protocol in a future episode and we will write our own HTTP server and client like the Chrome and the Google server. But for now, for, for now and for this episode, uh, let me just briefly explain that 
after the connection is made between the two processes. Now, the way that they are going to talk to each other could be based on some protocol because both of them should be able to understand each other and they cannot actually send any raw stuff to each other. So because uh, we know that this process, which is on port 80 on this machine is able to talk HTTP language and an HTTP protocol, we, we are going to send an HTTP request because we are the client. So we are going to tell, and, and you don't need to understand any of this. So we are going to tell it that get, get us the uh, index, and I'm specifying the HTTP version as 1.1, and then a backslash R and a backslash N. These are exactly stated in the uh, HTTP RFC document. And then a bunch of headers, of course, which the host header is mandatory and I'm going to tell google.com and then a backslash r and a backslash n and another backslash r and backslash n for, for the uh, body, of course. And there is no payload in, in our request. So we are going to send it to the other side and see if the, the request was okay. And after that, we are going to receive the response. So for that, we are going to use the receive function and pass the socket FD. And then let me change this name to message and create a buffer here. Char buffer 1024 and pass the buffer and then the size of the buffer, which is 1024 and the flag is zero. Okay. And at the end, let's print what, what we have received from the other side, from the Google server. So print F response was uh, the buffer. Okay, let's run and see the result. Okay, now after the connection was successful, you can see that the response was HTTP slash 1.1 1 .1, uh, 301 moved permanently. Now these are actually, these all have meaning in the HTTP protocol. And I'm not going to explain what are these headers that have been returned. And actually here you can see that after a backslash R backslash N, there is this body, which is an HTML. And your browser is exactly doing the same. You know, it is creating a socket. When, when you hit google.com, it is appending port 80. And then it is creating a socket and connecting to the Google server. And then it, it, it is sending this request and it is receiving the response. And then it actually tries to draw this content and create a UI, a user interface uh, for you in, in, in the Chrome. Now that we have used the client side socket and we've seen how, how it could be done. Now let's jump to the server side and write a little uh, server side socket programming and try to connect our own client to our own server. Okay, now I've created another project here, which is the socket server. And I'm going to implement the server side by side as the client in a, in a separate project. So let's get rid of this line here. And for the server side, of course, like the client side, we have to create a socket. And then instead of connecting to somewhere, we will actually ask uh, the socket API to listen for the incoming connection. So because we are going to use the same functions and, and same lines of code, I'm going to extract a bunch of uh, util functions here to make our application more readable. So this line, let me extract the function and tell that create a TCP socket, TCP IP version four socket. Okay, create a TCP IP version four socket. And as you can see, uh, the C lion ID, which is perfect as is has created this function for me and the implementation actually. And, and this, these five lines of code actually uh, is annoying me. And, and it's all about setting 
uh, this IP and port and creating an IP address. Now, it would be perfect to have a function that uh, we could pass the string form of the IP and the integer port number, and it could return to us a new uh, socket address. Now, let's do that exactly. Let's do the same here. Let's say that create IP version for address. And let's add two parameters here. The first one will be char star IP, the name IP, and then another one, which will be the unsigned integer, or let's just pass integer, it doesn't matter, the port. And let's create it, okay. Now, as you can see, it is returning a socket address but it should return a pointer to the socket address. Let me change this real quick here. Because uh, as you know, in the C language, when we create a socket address or anything inside a function, it will create it in the stack. And when the function returns all that uh, stuff, all that uh, fields that we have created in the stack, all these fields and these fields inside it, will be wiped actually uh, out of the memory. So we have to allocate some memory and then return it to the user of this function. But we have to warn the user that the user should free the memory that we have allocated for, for him. Okay, now here, let's instead of this, let's get rid of this because the IP is being uh, passed by the user and also the port. Let's get rid of this. And instead of doing this here, let's create a pointer and let's allocate with the function malloc. Let's allocate some memory and include the malloc.h. So I'm going to, actually we could do this without the pointers and, and return uh, the, a pointer to this address. But, but as I said, because it would be a, a local address inside the stack of this function, then after returning this address here, actually by calling another function, those memory, the place that it, the, the socket address was built and was occupied the memory, it, it might be get overridden, you know? So you have to allocate some memory and return that and be sure, make sure that it won't be overridden, the data inside. So let's create a pointer malloc. And this, the size of the bytes that we are going to allocate is uh, size of, the socket address structure, socket address in. So we are telling that please allocate, uh, I think it will 32 bytes. Yeah, no, 16 bytes. We are telling please allocate 16 bytes for us and return the pointer inside it. Now, instead of this dot here, we should either use the, the referencing by the pointer by star, or we could use this operator here, the arrow operator which will make our lives easier. Okay, and here as well. And then we return the address, the pointer, as you can see. And here, let's change it to a pointer to the address. And here, instead of the passing the pointer, because it's itself a pointer now, and this one would be address. Okay, and it should exactly do the same. Let me run it again to check that nothing is, oh, we have some problem. And oh, it's it's because the IP and the port, we have to pass them. Let's pass I port as number 80 and the IP as this number here. And run it again. And yeah, you can see that it is actually working. Now we have two lines of code for for all these uh, implementation and and it will save us a lot you know it, it will make the application more readable and actually we have not even uh, checked for the errors yet if we if we put the checking for errors code here it will be blotted you know and it will be it, it won't be readable because it's c language after all so we have to create and extract these functions and put all the information that it needs inside its own function. Okay, now we have these two functions. Let's create a util project, the third project, and 
import that project inside these two projects because we are go going to use the same functions inside the two projects, the client side and the server side. Now I've created this uh, third project, which is this, I've named it Socket Util, and it's, it's a library project. And I'm not going to go into details of how I created it and how I added to the CMake files of the two other projects, but actually you can do this. It's very easy. And if you want to know how to do that, let me know in the comments below. So I've created this project, this third project, and I've added to both the server and the client. Now in the client side, let's move these functions to the uh, util so that we could use it in the server side as well. So let's move these to the this project, this util project, which is this one. And let's move it inside the .h file, okay? And then the implementations, which is this one, should go into the .c file in the, in the library. Now, this is the library. And also there is this one, okay? And let me move it here. And the only thing that we have to do is to only include our own library here, which is socketutil.h. And you can see that if I compile the library and if I run it, the result will be exactly the same. So now it's very neat. You know, we have only the main function here and we could extract as many as functions as we'd like and move it to the util so that we could use it in the uh, server side as well. Now in the server side, let's go to the server side and let's use the same functions here. Let's say that, let's include the socket util. And as we said, for the server side, we have to create a socket as well. So I'm going to use our own function, socket ft. Let's say server socket file descriptor equals create TCP IP version four socket. And after that, again, we need the address, but this time this address will be used and not as some address to connect to somewhere, but this address will be used to bind out ourselves. The server will bind it to this address to listen for the incoming connections. So struct again socket address in server address equals create an IP version for address. And as IP, I'm going to pass empty string. We could pass the local host string, which is uh, 127.0.0.1. But let's pass an empty string and let's pass the port as, for example, 2000. Let's say that we are going to listen on port 2000 on this, on this machine, you know, on, on local host. And in, in the create IP version 4, I'm going to change this function. Uh, let's go to the util and say that, and so in the create IP version, if, if let's say that if IP is passed as empty string here, if uh, str len, the size of the IP is zero, which is empty string, instead of uh, setting this, let's set it to a special constant number which is address any in, I think, yeah, in add any. And else, if, if the IP has been passed to us, just change the presentation form to the network form and assign it to the field in the address. So here we, we are using this address any, meaning that uh, we, we are going to listen for any incoming address, you know? And we, we will use this constant only in the server side. So now that we could pass this end string, okay, now we have the uh, server address. Next thing that we should do in the server side after creating the socket and creating the address, we have to bind ourselves, the server, to, to this address. The function bind which receives the 
uh, file descriptor of the server will also ask for the server address and also the size of the address, of course. And it will try to bind, bind the process, bind the server process after the application runs. It will try to bind and occupy and acquire the open port number 2000 from the operating system. So by calling this bind function, we are telling the, to the operating system that this process wants the port number 2000 for listening to the incoming connections. And it will return a result, of course. And the result, if the result is zero, it means that we have bond ourselves uh, successfully. So if result is zero, then print f server socket was bound successfully. Okay. And after binding the process to this port and acquiring that port, so it will fail. It will fail here uh, for many reasons. And one of which could be that this port 2000 is occupied by some other server in this machine that the server is trying to run. And uh, we will later print the error here, but let's say that it will succeed. After binding, the next thing that we should do is to start listening for the incoming sockets. So by calling the listen function and passing the server socket file descriptor and pass a number, this number will be the number of the backlog, they say. And actually it means that after starting the listening phase, the incoming sockets will connect to the server socket. And before calling so the next function, which is the accept function, the server could queue all the receiving connection up to 10 connections. So we are specifying the backlog amount. And let's again create the result, the listen result, for example. And this result will, of course, will be uh, zero if, if it is a su successful listening. After listening, if we call the accept function, it will block. You know, the calling the accept function is a blocking call. So after calling the accept function, it will actually uh, return the file descriptor of the connecting client, you know. So it will create a file descriptor on the server side for each connecting socket, and it will return that file descriptor. And from there on, from that moment, we will have access to the file descriptor of the client in the server side, you know, and it will be exactly the same, identical as to the client side. After having the sockets in, connected in both sides, uh, we could use exactly the same functions, the send and receive, and create and use this mold two channel byte string. So the accept is asking for the server file descriptor. And after that, it is asking for an address, a pointer to an address. So this address will be filled, will be filled with the address of the remote client. So we have to create a struct socket add in a pointer to client address and let's actually first instead of creating a pointer let's create the structure itself and let's pass the address of pointer to this client address and the size of this address of course this is there is a tricky part here with the accept function it is asking for the size of the address that we are passing, right? Because it wants to understand whether it's an IP version 4 or IP version 6. But uh, it is asking for the pointer to the size of the address, not, not the size itself. And we have to create this client address size. And we have to pass the pointer to this client address. But before passing this, we have to assign the size of the client address. 
Okay. Or we could pass the struct socket address in. It doesn't matter. You know, both of them are the same. So what the the act the function accept will do is that it will first try to use the number that is inside this client address, and then it will fill it with the size of the client address that it receives. You know, it will, so it, it is using this uh, parameter for two purposes. And now after the accept int accept result, the accept result would be a socket file descriptor if it is a successful result. So let's name it a client socket file descriptor. And if it is a negative number, it means that some error has happened. After the connection, now at this point, the connection have been made successfully. Let's uh, assume that it is, it's been made successfully. We will actually try to write the if statements and check the results one by one, you know, both in the bind and listen and the accept to see if, if actually it has succeeded to this point. Now, but let's assume that it is succeeded. Now at this point, this socket FD is exactly this socket file descriptor in the client side. So we have access to the file descriptor of the client socket in the server side, and we could use it to send and receive data. So let's actually, because we know that it is sending this message, Let's receive it in, in this side and see if, if we are successful in, in receiving and printing the message from the client side. Now we have the client socket file descriptor. The only thing we left to do is to copy and paste this, this exact same stuff here and say that we are creating a buffer and we are going to receive from the client socket file descriptor as much as 1024, it could be less, you know, the receive function will return the amount that it has read. And then we are going to uh, print it here. So let's run this application. And and yeah, let's first run it. I was, I was going to say that we have to close and shut down the sockets because the sockets might be actually left unclosed. So let's first run it. Now the socket was bound successfully and it is actually, as you can see, it is stopping and waiting for the uh, client to connect. And let me just real quick here, open a terminal and run this lsof command dash i and port 2000. So what this command does is that it will show all the connections and all the processes that are listening on port 2000 or are connected to the port 2000. And you, inside the windows, in the command prompt of the windows, you could use uh, other command for this, but I've forgotten the command. So if we hit enter, you can see that the processor with this number has opened this file descriptor with this number, and it, ha it has opened the TCP. It is listening on, on port 2000 on, on the TCP. So we have a process actually. And this is, this is the process that is running. And if we run this, we are expecting it to connect to, to the server. Now let's change these to 2000 because we are not going to connect to the Google this time. We are going to connect to the same machine. So the same machine address is the local host address, which is 127.0.0.0. .0 .0. One, it's in a special address uh, named the uh, local host address. And it means that we, we are asking the operating system to look for a process inside the same machine. Now that we have set the client to connect to this side, let's run it and see if it will actually connect and send stuff. So if we run it, okay, you can see that it has sent this stuff, this data, get slash from this side to this side. Because we are not printing the stuff in between, you know, we have to print that listening was successful, the binding was successful, 
a client was connected and so on and so forth. But you can see actually the connection was successful and the client connected to the server and sent stuff and the server received those stuff from the, the socket client file descriptor. So at this point, I think that we are almost done, but uh, because we are going to spice it up a little bit, we are going to create a, a chat group application. So a chat group application will have a server, which is our server socket application, and will have multiple clients connected to it. So these clients will send messages to the server and the server will broadcast it to the other sockets so that all the clients will think that they are inside some kind of a chat application, uh, a, a chat room, for example, that they can they could talk to each other. And we will use, of course, some threading and multi-threading stuff, and I'll explain it in details. So let's jump to the chat application. So for the chat application, the client side should be able to listen for, uh, ask for inputs from the console and send all the inputs to the server side. But it is now it is only sending some constant message. So let's first start from this part and change it to and use the get line function of the C language for asking for a line of characters from the console and send it to the other side. So for that, we need char star buffer. Now let's make the buffer as 1024 and let's use the get line function. And for the get line function, uh, we should send pass the pointer to the line and also pass the size of the buffer. So instead of doing this, let me do this trick here and pass null here. Passing null is is very important as they say, because if you uh, pass the line, let me change this name to line as well. We are passing a pointer to the line and it is initialized with null value. And it means that we are asking the, the get line function to create a buffer on our behalf. And if we pass the size, size T, I think, yeah, line, size as zero as initial value. So address to pointer to line size. And we are passing standard input for reading from the console. And it will return the line count, or for example, we should say, we could say that char count, the amount of the characters that it read from the uh, console. Now we should put it inside a while loop because we want to send all the user types to the server side. So let's create a while loop here, a while true. It should be a while true. And let me import it from the boolean.h, stdbool.h. And let me move it here. Okay, and get line inside it. And let's have a printf here telling that type and for example, we will send whatever. And let's tell that type exit for, for exiting from the application because it's a while true loop here. Okay, and pass backslash n. Now here, after receiving this line after this this function returns the line buffer is filled with the characters and the ca char count is filled with the uh, count of the characters inside that line so all we have to do is to send it so let me copy this line here and say that we want to send the line but this time as much as the size of the char count Okay, and let's say that, let me see, it is returning SS size T amount was sent. 
and it might return minus one, meaning that it couldn't send anything. And the other side has closed the socket. We will get back to the errors, you know. So after sending, it will again loop back. But before sending, let's say that if the char count is greater than zero and if uh, str compare we are comparing this entered line with exit so that if the client hits exit we want to uh, exit from the application equals zero uh, break from the while true loop and if not else let's get rid of this else so if it is not exit it will send it to the other side okay and sorry we could get rid of these of course and let me run it let, let me run the server so now the server is running and the client has connected hopefully let's type some something in the, in the client side and see if it will send it to the server side let's say hi yeah as you can see it, it received it but it's closed immediately after receiving because there there must be a while true loop on this side for receiving as well so let's have a while true loop here oh sorry imported and inside it let me bring the buffer above of the while true loop and then receive and print it so after receiving let's uh, ask for the amount received and see that if amount received is greater than zero then print it okay and if of course the amount received is less than zero it means that some error has happened you know for example the client side has closed it so we have to break from this loop as well and after breaking from this loop let's uh, do the closing and shutting down side so for closing and shutting down first we have to uh, close the file the client file descriptor i'm importing it from this header file and client socket fd so i'm closing the client socket file descriptor in the server side and then i'm shutting down the server file descriptor with shut down read and write and we should do the same in the client side as well and say close close the socket fd okay now let's run it again and let's run the client again and let's type hi okay it says hi how are you okay it is sending how are you and one one two and okay i see what is going on so because in the in the client side this buffer we are every time we are using the line to send it you know you can see that the char count is used to send to this side so line char count but it is also sending the previous you know you can see that the first one was how are you and with the one it again sent the wr no it is not sending actually i see it is in this side we are receiving to the buffer so after amount received before printing we should do this we should say that buffer amount received equals zero so we are putting this zero character the null character exactly at the place the all the correct characters have been received so when we print print the response uh, it will print until the last message not the previous message because the previous messages have been buffered inside this buffer and before showing the result let me just show you the processes that are listening on port 2000 so i mean you can see that the first line 
is this process 60,232, which has this file descriptor and is listening. So you can see that these two processes, this one and this one, are, ha are having these, actually these two file descriptors, you know? And there are three connections. One is listening and the other two are established. And the, your operating system is actually printing all this stuff. You can see that whether the connection was successful, whether the server is listening successfully or not. So yeah, that was a proof. And let me type exit here and see if it works. Okay, it works. This one finished, but this one is not actually, I think the receive will return zero when the connection is closed. I think, yeah, it will return zero. So if it is zero, then close. Now, if we stop, because we didn't shut down gracefully, you know, the, the socket file descriptor might be left. No, it is not. Okay. Now let's run it again. Now the second socket was bound successfully and let's connect the client and let's say, hi, how are you? Okay, fine. You can see it is okay. And then at the last exit. So both, both sides are exiting and finishing and they are closing and shutting down. Okay, now the client side is able to send stuff to the, to the server side. Now, the server side should be able to listen for multiple incoming connections simultaneously. But as you can see, there are a bunch of blocking functions, meaning that when we call those functions, it will wait and block the current thread, which is the main thread. There is this accept function, which will block this main thread here until an incoming connection is arrived. And also there is this get line function. The receive doesn't block actually, but the get line will block here. So we have to actually use the threading here for and create a new thread for each accepted incoming connection and listen for the received messages from that client, from that specific client in a, in a separate thread in the server. So let's jump to the threading. So for before doing the threading part, let's first do a little bit refactoring and cleaning up in the server side because we are going to accept multiple clients, multiple sockets. And these lines here actually will be duplicated, you know? So let's create another function here and this will block and accept an incoming connection and it will return the properties and fields about that connection inside a custom structure. So let me <clears throat> say that accept incoming connection, for example. And let's say that instead of returning a simple socket FD file descriptor, let's say it will return a structure, you know, a complicated structure. So that structure will have, I'm creating a new structure, struct, accepted client. Let's name it accepted or socket, accepted socket. The accepted socket will of course have a file descriptor, accepted socket file descriptor. And also it will have a socket address. So struct socket address in address. And it, it will have the error, of course, whether it because it might be the result might be an error. And let's add a Boolean here telling that accepted successfully. OK, now in this function, accept incoming connect, instead of returning integer, we will we want to return a pointer to accepted socket structure. Let me change this part as well. And here, inside it, first we create the uh, this socket address, client address, and then the size. And after accepting it, we want to create 
and accept that socket structure and fill it with the data that we have it here and return it to the user of this function. And the user of, of the function, of course, should be responsible for freeing up the memory that we have allocated here. So let's say that we are needing an accepted socket structure, a pointer to that, of course, accepted socket, and allocate as much as uh, struct accepted socket. And then let's fill the accepted socket, the address with the received address, client address, and then the accepted socket uh, file descriptor will be a client socket file descriptor, of course, and accepted socket accepted successfully means that the client file descriptor is greater than zero because if the result of this function is a negative number, it means that the it wasn't ex accepted successfully and it was an error. And let's say that if accepted socket not accepted successfully, if it is not accept accepted successfully, then put the error number inside the error so the, this number instead of being the client socket file descriptor which will be the error number so we put it inside the error and we return the uh, accepted socket so this function here will actually do all the needy greedy stuff and all the complicated stuff not complicated actually i don't want i didn't want to make here actually blotted you know so that we could see what is going on so this accept incoming connection will receive the server socket FD and will return uh, structure accepted socket. Let's say client socket. Okay. And then we could do client socket accepted socket file descriptor and also client socket accepted file descriptor. And it should do exactly the same. Uh, if we run it, you'll see that it is exactly the same. Hi, how are you? And exit. Both of them are exiting. Okay. Now, we have done actually a little bit refactoring here to actually see what is going on. We could move this function to, of course, to the util and make here a little bit pretty you know needy so <clears throat> let's get to the part when, where we do some multi-threading so first we accept the connection and then we receive the data as much as possible and we write it we could turn this into another function let me extract it and say that listen or let's say receive incoming receive and print incoming data okay and it is only getting the accepted client no we should simply pass the socket fd the file descriptor no we don't need to pass this huge parameter and it will do the same yep and let me change the signature here okay and this part this side here is saying that as we know uh, listen for the console and send all the type letters until a backslash in hitting in the enter to the server side and now we are ready for the threading part so for the threading part we have to run this accepting incoming connection inside another a separate thread because it will uh, block the main thread so let's say that we have this function that says start accepting start accepting incoming connections and if i hit alt enter and 
tell it to create the new function for me. Okay, create it. And we have to, of course, pass the client socket, uh, the, sorry, the server socket file descriptor. So server socket file descriptor. And I'm going to cut this line and bring it here inside the start accepting connection. So here we are going to create a new thread. And for creating a new thread, a separate thread, we will use pthread create function. And let's import it. And it is actually from the pthread.h include file. And it will simply, if I want to explain it simply, it will create a new thread in the operating system and it will ask for, for a function and it will run this function that we are passing inside a separate thread, you know, simultaneously side by side. So we have to pass a function, you know, as you can see, the second parameter is a function and the third parameter is, uh, is the arguments to that function. So let's say that, of course, we should create this p thread underline t as the ID and pass it is the thread ID and then pass as the attribute. Let's pass null as the attribute because we are not setting any null. And then we are going to pass a function. So as this function, I'm going to tell it to run the accept incoming connection inside a separate thread and pass int socket server socket file descriptor and pass the server socket file descriptor to the, to the function. And we can get rid of this. Okay, it will call the accept incoming connection or I think we should use, let's, let's create another function here and say void uh, accept new connection and listen and print and receive and print its data. Okay. And again, we have to pass the server socket file descriptor and I have to move it here. Let me cut and paste it here. And we are going to tell the thread to call this function, you know, run this function instead of the other function. So let me put the signature at the top. And OK. So we are calling start accepting incoming connections. And we are passing, I think we should. Yep, accept incoming connections, accept, start listening for incoming connections. Yeah, that is correct now. And then we call this receive and print incoming data. Let's cut this line and bring it here. Receive and print incoming data from the client socket. Client socket dot accepted file descriptor. And I think this should do the work this should do the magic actually. So let me comment this line and we could bring it here. Okay, and then shut down the server. So now what the server does is actually binds it, itself to the address and then it listens for the incoming connections and then it starts accepting incoming connections in a separate thread, you know, not on the main thread. So by calling this function, it will create a separate thread. And on that separate thread, it will call this function, which is this one. And this function should be inside a while true loop to accept as many as incoming connections. So while true, let's say that the client socket, okay, now accept new connection and receive and print its data. Mm -hmm. So let me see, that is the function here. It calls this one. And in this one, it accepts the incoming connection and it receives 
okay, it it's uh, this itself, these two lines will block again. So we have to, other than creating a separate thread for listening and accepting, we have to create a separate thread for each socket to receive the data from that specific socket. So let's create another function here. After accepting a client, let's say that receive and print incoming data on separate thread. And let's pass the client socket. Okay. Let me create the function here. So the client socket. And now we can cut these two lines here. And here uh, we have to tell it to uh, run this one on, on actually. So let's say that P thread, we have to create a thread, of course, P thread create and an ID, we have to create an ID, P thread ID or T, I think, yeah, it was T ID. And let's pass the ID and then null as the attribute and then the function. So let's call the function uh, receive incoming, receive and print incoming data on a separate thread because it's a blocking function and pass the client socket, the P socket, accepted file descriptor. Okay. Now we should get rid of this one and we can move the close at the end here. So after the receive has been done, we can close the socket FD, the file descriptor. Okay, so let me just explain what is going on here. So we have this main function here. Let me just bring it down. And these are all the functions, other functions. So the main function is a simple function. It is not actually simple, but because we have refactored and created a bunch of other functions, you know, it makes the application, as you can see, more readable. So after creating the TCP IP version 4 socket, and after listening and binding on this address on the port 2000, we start accepting incoming connections. So by calling this start accepting incoming connections, I should, of course, get rid of this shutdown here because let me comment this line. So by calling this start accepting incoming connections, it will create a separate thread. And on that thread, it will call this accept new connection and receive and print its data. So, and, and it, it will pass the server socket file descriptor. Now let's get to that function, which is this one and see what is going on here. So in this function, because we are assured that we are running on a separate thread, we could safely create a while true loop. And inside this while true loop, we accept an incoming connection. We block here, it will block here. And after a client is returned uh, in this structure, we, we, pass it, we pass that client to this receive and print incoming data on separate thread. And we call this function. This function, again, will create another thread because receiving and printing it has a while true loop and it will be blocking. So we want to have a while true loop for each received clients. So we have to create a new thread for each of them. Again, we create a new thread and we call the receive and print data on that new thread and we pass the uh, client socket file descriptor. Now in that function, we simply have a while true loop and uh, uh, when, when the socket is closed, we just close the file descriptor. Now let's run this and see if it just runs for a single client and then let's see if we could run it for multiple clients. So let me run it. Okay, the process finished with exit code zero. For what, for some reason it is finishing. Oh, I think that we should start accepting incoming connection on the main thread because it is uh, jumping to this return zero and it is ignoring other threads. So start accepting incoming connection. Let's have it here. So let me move this 
there. Okay, here. So instead of creating a new thread for accepting, we will do the accepting on the main thread. We could use the join function on the P thread to join to this thread, but I'm not going to do that. So uh, this will work, I think, now. And, and now we could use the shutdown as well, because this function is a blocking function, and the shutdown will be called after all the accepting is done. So let's run the server again, and let's run the client, and let's print some data. Hi, how are you? And exit. Okay, it exited, but the server is still running. And if we run the client again, hopefully it will connect again to the server. So let's say hi again. So you can see that it is sending stuff. And it is a new client, you know, it's a separate client. Now, let's actually try and connect multiple clients to this server. Now, for connecting multiple simultaneous clients to the server, uh, because the IDE, we cannot use the IDE here. Let me exit this one. We can we could not use the IDE because the IDE will run this application in, in a single uh, process and we cannot ask it to run it multiple times, you know, because if we run this client multiple times, it will kill the previous process and it will replace the new process. So let me just get, go to the uh, folders, you know, to where the projects resides. Now we have this socket client and socket server, and we don't need this util for this matter. So inside each of them, there is this build folder, which is about the building stuff and compiling stuff. And there is this executable file. So I'm going to use these files and, and call them and execute them manually instead of from the IDE. So let me open a, a actually command prompt, the terminal here, and tell to run the socket server. Now the socket is running. Now let me get to the client side, the socket client, and into the build and open a terminal here. And let me just resize it. And let's run the client as well, socket client, okay? Now the socket client has hopefully connected to the server. And if we say, hi, you can see that it is printing here, hi, how are you? Okay, now let's see what will happen if we create another, if we execute another uh, client. So let's say socket client, and let me open another one, socket client, okay. Now we have these three clients, you know, the three of them are running exactly the same executable file. And let's see if I type anything here, uh, one, two, one, two, three. So you can see that it, it is printing here. And if, if I type anything inside here, uh, for example, A, E, I, O, U. So you can see it is printing as well. And this one as well. So the three clients are, connected simultaneously, these three clients are connected simultaneously to the server and the three of them could send stuff. And as you can see, it is receiving all of them, you know, Be because if we didn't use the threading uh, and because the accepting function was a blocking function and, and receiving in a while true loop was a blocking function, we could only serve and satisfy a single client. But now because using this threading and because we are creating a new thread for each while true loop, and, and that is why we are able to let multiple, as many as clients as we want to connect to the server. Now, in order to make it a real chat application, a public chat group application, first we have to actually ask for the name of the user that is using the client. And then we have to broadcast the received message from the server to the other clients. So when the user A, this first user, for example, sends hi here, the server should send the 
high to these two other clients and say, say that, for example, the first client has said hi. So let's jump to that. Let me just kill all these. Let's type exit, exit and exit. And let me kill this one as well. Okay. Now in the, in the server side, actually we have to gather all these accepted sockets. And when a message is received, we have to send the, this, the received message to the other sockets other than the one that we have received the message from. So let's have this. Let me, I know this, this is a scene actually having a global variable, but let's have it for the sake of this example. Let's have a actually struct accepted socket, for example, of size 10. And accepted, sorry, should do this, accepted sockets. And let me have this counter accepted sockets count, which is zero as the start. And here, when we accept the client, we put it inside that array. So accepted sockets, accepted socket count plus plus equals client socket. So I, here I'm just only gathering all the accepted sockets into some global variable so that when, when, a, when a message is arrived and received, we could send it to the other ones. So inside this receive function, receive and print incoming data here, receive and print incoming data. After receiving, I want to be able to send the received message to the other client. So let's say that after receiving, if the received amount is greater than zero, uh, I'm going to send received message to the other clients. And the message is, of course, the buffer. Okay, now let me create this function here. And the buffer will be char star. Okay, here, oh, of course, we should pass this socket FD as well because we should know that which socket file descriptor we are receiving this uh, message from. So let me add the second parameter as well and pass the socket FD. Now inside here, we should iterate over all the accepted clients in a for loop for int i equals zero until i is less than accepted sockets count i plus plus and then if accepted socket i file descriptor is not equal to our socket file descriptor it means that uh, it is another socket client and we want to send the receive message to this one because if they are both the same, it means that we don't want to send the same received message to the same client. So let's say that uh, send to accepted sockets and I dot file descriptor and the message is buffer and the size of the message is stra string length buffer and we pass zero as the flag, okay? And I think that should do it. So, but in the client side, you can see that we are only sending the stuff. We are not receiving the stuff. So we should create another thread in the client side for, because the reading, uh, because the sending uh, stuff is a blocking. You know, you can see that we have a while true loop here. We have to have another, separate thread in each client that could listen for the messages uh, for the messages received from the server so 
let's have this and let's say that uh, start listening uh, messages, start listening and print messages. And let's pass the socket FD and create the function. Okay. And here it is exactly actually the same as this one, receive and print. And I could copy and paste it. I could create it and a function inside the util, but let's first just copy and paste it. Later we can refactor it. So we have the socket file descriptor and we don't need the send here. And at the end, we just close it. Okay, actually uh, the function is start listening and print messages should start a new separate thread for itself. And it is not doing that. And it is blocking, you know, and it is blocking on receiving the stuff and it is not sending anything to the other side. So let's first create a thread here and let's change this name. Start listening and printing messages on new thread. And let's create a thread here. P thread, sorry, P thread underline T as the ID and P thread create import it here as well and then pass the pointer to id and then null and then the function let's create another function let me extract these to another function and name it listen and print okay and let's call this function in this thread and pass the socket file descriptor to the function now, because uh, this function, which we are calling it here, will return immediately and it won't block. So this this while true loop will be calling and it will actually listen for what we type in the console. And the other thread will separately and independently will uh, inside this while true loop will listen for a receive function. So. I think that if we run it this time, we will succeed. Let me compile both sides and let me run the socket. So the socket is bound successfully and let's bring up all the clients as well. Okay, these are the three clients. Now this one, this one, and this one. Now let's type something at the first one, hi. So you can see that hi was sent to server and it was sent to the two other uh, clients as well, not not the not the same one that sent the message. And for example, if from here we send one two three, the one two three will be sent to server, and the server will send it to these two other clients. So you can see this actually this chat public chat application is possible with the uh, using the server sockets and the server clients. And we have added the threading, of course, because we have multiple while true loops, or for example, uh, blocking functions like accept or uh, like the receive function, or the get line. For calling the get line, of course, will block until the user types and hits enter. So it is working. Now let's add another layer to it, and let's. First, in the client side, ask for the name of the client so that the messages could be distinguished because now you can see that the response was, you know, it, it is not perfect. So, so let's, let me exit from all of them. Sorry, I exit, okay. And get rid of this client, the server, sorry. And here in the client side, before actually sending the message, let's first ask for the name. So let's say, let me copy and paste these lines here and say uh, name and name size. And let's say, please enter your name. And then ask for the name. name count 
and name and name size okay and it should be of course before all these now at this point we have the name and then we ask for the messages so before sending before sending this line let's append the name to the start of the line and send the message that way so let's say that we have a buffer here char buffer which is 1024 and let's first actually append let me let's do this let's say that s print f by calling the s print f function we could append multiple strings together so we are saying that append it to the buffer buffer in this way so s colon s and mm, let's give the name and then the line so first the name and the line of course but the name because the name has a backslash in at the end of it of course also the line itself now it will be uh first the name and the backslash in then the line so let's get rid of that ex extra backslash in here so let's say name name dot name size minus one equals zero by doing this actually i'm getting rid of the last character which is the backslash n and also we could do the same of course in the line as as well so let's do the same and say that line line size minus one <clears throat> no we should do it here of course char count minus one equals zero and let's bring it here and pass first <clears throat> the name and the line and the line is of course char star so there should be no problem and here instead of sending the line sorry instead of sending the line we will send the a buffer and as much as the buffer counts so str length buffer uh, buffer yep here uh, we have a typo we have to add uh, put the percentage here and also in the uh, in here instead of name size we should give the name count because the name count is the uh, count of the characters that have been read by by the get line so name count minus one and then here i uh and instead of doing the backslash n of course we should give the exit because we are getting rid of that last backslash n this time so if we run the server again and if we run this side and we could give our name and hi and you can see that masood hi or other other goodbye for example and then exit so now the name is actually specified now get let's get rid of this response was actually the response was in this side mm. control f response was yep let's get rid of that and now if we compile it and this side as well and if we run it <clears throat> multiple times i'm going to run the clients multiple times okay let me clear running the server running the oh the client is not running because uh it is running already here let me get rid of this and this we should first close this one because it is occupying the port 2000 and now let's clear run it again again it's not running you know because the address is already in use sometimes it doesn't clear the process you know let me check if the process is oh you can see that the port is still in the close wait state so it means that we have not gracefully closed and shut down 
and it is not taking the port 2000 as an empty port. So let's kill those uh, processes, sudo kill dash nine, 2,996 and 21,007 and also 22581, okay? Now, it is, I think we are clear to go. Now, let's run the server. Okay, the server was bound successfully. And the clients, let's run the clients as well. And this client, okay. Now let's put the name as John for the first one and Tom for the second one and Joe for the third. Now, if for example, Tom writes something, hi, you can see that it's Tom says hi and the other two, we should get rid of this response was as well. The other two are receiving Tom hi. And let's send something from John, hi. So, yep, John said hi, and other two are receiving John said hi. Or this one should say hi from Joe. Yeah. So you can see that the chat application is working, actually. And we could client as we could connect as many as clients as one as we want to the server, and the server will broadcast all those uh, received messages to the other clients. So to wrap it up, we created a socket application, a client server application that multiple simultaneous clients could connect to the server. And we used multi-threading and uh, some other tools for that. Now, of course, we could ask for the uh, port and the IP from the arguments, you know, from the arguments of the main function here and here. And also we have not, we are not checking for the errors yet. You know, we should have this if statement after each function, for example, after the bind, listen, accept, we should do all these checking for the edge cases and corner cases and errors. I know the C grooves and nerds are now screaming that, oh, don't do this, don't do that. It's not efficient for the memory consumption and i think that i know that we have uh, we have a lot of problems with this code and we could refactor and free the memory and make it memory efficient and, and so on and so forth but you kind of get the uh, overall idea here of how using the socket programming and it is actually the closest that we could get to the berkeley sockets and in the next episodes we will write socket the same application with python with java and c sharp and you'll see that almost exactly the same process we'll have there and just a little bit abstraction you know will be added just that you know just but the rest will be the same so stay tuned for the next episodes